Thank you for being here with us. Good night from our NBC News headquarters here in New York. Tonight on All In, the Saudis uh, are going to have a lot of uh, involvement in this if we decide to do something. President awaits instruction from the orb. Saudi Arabia pays cash. Tonight is the president outsourcing his duties as commander-in-chief to Saudi Arabia. And what is he getting out of it? Saudi Arabia, and I get along great with all of them. They buy apartments from me, they spend 40 million, 50 million. Plus, why Adam Schiff is raising alarm bells over an intelligence community cover-up. I think it's fair to assume this involves either the president or people around him or both. Then, Michael Moore on the massive UAW strike. You stand with the auto workers in the strike against today. As the world gathers for a climate action summit, Naomi Klein on her burning case for a Green New Deal. And All In starts right now. Good evening from New York. I'm Chris Hayes. The President of the United States, the Commander-in-Chief of America's Armed Forces, stands ready to dispatch the U.S. Armed Forces at the behest and direction of a foreign prince. He has, over the weekend via Twitter, essentially pledged the entirety of American military might in the service of a man who he seems devoted to almost above any other world leader in stiff competition with Vladimir Putin. The man, of course, is Saudi Arabia's Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, known as MBS. In the wake of the news that two major Saudi oil facilities were attacked over the weekend, the Houthi rebels in Yemen have claimed responsibility. The U.S. and the Saudis say it was Iran behind it. Meanwhile, President Donald Trump basically announced on Twitter, you tell us what to do, my crown prince, and we shall do it for you. Now, to be clear, the U.S. has had a close relationship with the Saudis for decades upon decades under Republicans and Democrats, but what has happened under this administration is on a whole other level. Let's just review for a second. The very first international trip that Donald Trump took as president was to Saudi Arabia, breaking with decades of precedent, in which the first trip is usually Canada or Mexico. And you remember on that trip, do you remember the orb and the sword dance? I mean, who else would Donald Trump be willing to do that with? President Trump has issued, in his entire time as president, he's issued five vetoes, and four of them have been to protect the Saudis. He has bumped up weapon sales to the Saudis. He has defended the Saudis as they have created the worst humanitarian crisis in the world in Yemen. The United Nations says 10 million Yemenis are, quote, one step away from famine. Members of Trump's administration have defended them and praised and laughed and smiled with them after they hacked to death a columnist for an American newspaper. A murder, the CIA says, was personally ordered by the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. The two countries that Trump will bend over backwards for are Russia and Saudi Arabia. Why? Well, here's one obvious reason. Saudi Arabia, and I get along great with all of them. They buy apartments from me, they spend 40 million, 50 million. Am I supposed to dislike them? I like them very much. He told you. Right there. Back when he's running president, he told you what it's about. They give lots and lots of money to Donald Trump's businesses. There it is. Now, thanks to some great reporting, we also know little snapshots about how Saudi Saudis have helped Trump's bottom line since he became president, like when they rolled into town and spent enough money at the Trump International Hotel in Manhattan to boost the hotel's revenue for the entire quarter, or the time a Saudi-funded lobbyist paid for 500 rooms at Trump's D.C. hotel. But those are just little snippets we've caught here, thanks to reporting and whistleblowers. We don't know much else. It would be helpful to have the president's tax returns, which have been requested by the House of Representatives under U.S. law, but are being blocked by the White House and being fought in court. Today, another avenue was opened with the Manhattan District Attorney demanding Trump's tax returns for the last eight years. What else is there? What are the financial arrangements with Jared Kushner, who is so close to the Crown Prince that when Kushner visited Saudi Arabia after MBS had just locked up dozens of political rivals, quote, the two princes are said to have stayed up until nearly 4 a.m. several nights swapping stories and planning strategy. Today, the United States, our country, finds itself at the point where the president is threatening war, threatening to put American lives, the lives of American service members, American blood, American treasure, on the line for the guy who hacked Jamal Khashoggi to death for a regime that spends lots of money at his hotels. Joining me now, Ben Rhodes, former Deputy National Security Advisor under President Obama, who's also an advisor on the Iran deal that President Trump withdrew from last year. He is now an MSNBC political contributor. I guess let's start with just where we are right now over the weekend. 
drone strikes on these uh, the Saudi oil uh, refineries. The Houthis, the rebels in Yemen, uh, who are fighting with the Saudis in Yemen, say it was them. The U.S. and Saudis saying it was Iran. What do you make of this situation? Well, Chris, first of all, we have to be very clear. We would not be at this point were it not for Trump's foreign policy. Pulling out of the Iran deal, piling sanctions on the Iranians, giving a blank check to Mohammed bin Salman to wage his war in Yemen against the Houthis. It is logical that it would follow from that and was predicted by many of us that if he followed that course, the Iranians would escalate in kind. So whether it was the Houthis or some people suggest this is a more sophisticated weapon that can only come from the Iranians, this is the logical endpoint of Trump's own escalation. And we have no interest in going to war on behalf of an attack on Saudi oil infrastructure. We have no interest in going to war on behalf of Mohammed bin Salman, who would like nothing more than the United States to do his bidding in taking out the Iranian regime. That has been what he has wanted since he became the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. So we see before our eyes the corruption of American foreign policy. We are being asked to do something that is not in our interest that the American people would not support. Yeah, there's this, uh, a while ago there was an Onion article on John Bolter when, Bolton when those, those tankers were hit in the Gulf that said an attack on two Saudi oil tankers is an attack on all Americans. But I feel like I'm losing my mind watching people talk about this. Obviously, like, you don't want this to escalate. You certainly don't want a hot conventional war between the Saudis and Iran, and you, there are steps that should be taken. But, but what, what the heck is the U.S. interest in defending the Saudi government from drone attacks on their oil facilities. And well, first of all, because you have to think about this from the perspective of the Middle East. There has been a war that has been going on in Yemen. Yes, this we just haven't seen it, it and yeah, attacking the South. Exactly. Right? So the way people need to think about this or watching this is, this is not the first strike on the Saudi infrastructure in a new war. This is part of a war that has been ongoing for since Mohammed bin Salman became crown prince against the Houthis in Yemen that has led to the deaths of tens of thousands of people, famine that puts millions of lives at risk. When we were at the end of the Obama administration, what were we trying to do? We had an Iran deal in place to prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon and provide a foundation for some capacity to have diplomacy with Iran. We also went to the Saudis and urged them to open a channel with the Iranians. We said, you do not want this proxy war to escalate all across the region, in part because it could draw us in, in part because you can't win that proxy war. Nobody can win. Everybody will lose if this escalates. And what did they do? They said, no. Mohammed bin Salman had recently become the crown prince and the defense minister. He wanted to show how tough he was. The place he wanted to do that was in Yemen. And here we are. This is the logical endpoint of Trump and Mohammed bin Salman's completely wrong-handed approach to the conflict with Iran. You know, I want to weigh in right there real quick pertaining to what he's talking about. He's basing his information off of old information. Going all the way back into the Obama era, okay? What just happened this weekend exceeds that knowledge to the point that now some new players have stepped in to cause this type of devastation. These new players is what America in our intel is saying was coming from Iran. It is obvious that it is a tender box that is fixing to go up in flames in a magnitude or in a degree like we have never seen before if they don't somehow or another find a way of putting out this fire. And according to biblical Bible prophecy, whenever it talks about the blood over in the Euphrates getting as deep as a horse's bridle, whenever it talks about the affairs towards fleeing to the mountains whenever you shall see these things start to occur all odds are stacked against towards being able to put this particular fire out because now it is at a boiling point and this guy whoever he was speaking can say whatever he wants to about Donald Trump being one of the main instigators in causing this fire to get out of hand like this simply because of pulling out of the nuclear deal. But the fact of the matter is this has been an ongoing 
deal towards who is the king of the mountain out there for quite some times and now we're having some new involvements some new players per se that are really reaching out towards saying hey we're in this too it's it's complicated in one way but in another way if you'll follow the charts pertaining to biblical Bible prophecy, it is right on target. Please, let's listen. The president today sort of came out and said a little bit of what his thinking is about all this, and he basically made the argument that essentially the Saudi, Bin Salman keeps oil prices low for me. I can personally adjust the price of oil, ergo I owe him. This is, this is what he said today in the White House. Take a listen. A Saudi Arabia pays cash. They've helped us out from the standpoint of jobs and all of the other things. And they've actually helped us. I would call and I would say, listen, our oil prices, our gasoline's too high. you got to let more go. You know that. I would call the Crown Prince and I'd say, uh, you got to help us out. you got to get some more. And all of a sudden, the oil starts flowing and the gasoline prices are down. No other president can do that. What do you make? I mean, I, first of all, Chris, the instability that Trump is causing in this region by pulling out the Iran deal is a factor in driving up oil prices, right. right? So let's be very clear. Donald Trump is part of the reason why your prices are going up, whatever Mohammed bin Salman is telling him. The other thing is... The prices of oil for the past two years have been steadily declining rather than, than going up. And this guy is contradicting that. He's saying that oil prices is going up on account of Donald Trump. Whenever you have the right hand not knowing what the left hand is doing, this is the irregularities that you run into pertaining to too many chiefs and not enough Indians. Nothing, people talk about the Iranians in the right. The Iranians destabilize and meddle in other countries. So do the Saudis. Right now, the Saudis are meddling in Yemen. They're meddling in Libya. They're meddling in Iraq. They are doing the same things that people complain about the Iranians doing, all of which could contribute to a rise in oil prices, a risk of conflict, destabilizing the region. What do we know? We also know that the Saudis spend enormous amounts of money at Trump hotel properties. We don't know. They own the 45th floor of Trump Tower. Well, what we also don't know, Chris, is what is happening in those conversations between Jared Kushner and the Saudi Crown Prince. What promises are being made about potential investments after the Trump presidency? So it seems to me that the corruption at the heart of the Trump presidency, the Trump foreign policy, can be seen in Saudi Arabia. And it doesn't get the same attention as the domestic issues that we're all concerned about because we're Americans. But we should care that we could end up in a war because we have a, a Saudi crown prince who is a murderer who killed and brutally chopped up a journalist for the Washington Post in another country who now wants us to do his bidding. He wants a return on his investment in Jared Kushner and Donald Trump. Saudi Arabia pays cash. That's what the president said in the White House today in justifying why he would maybe go to war on behalf of the Saudis. Ben Rhodes, thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. Join me now for more Rula Jabril, a journalist, foreign policy analyst who specializes in Middle Eastern affairs and has been reporting on uh, the Saudis and the conflict in the region. Um, I think there's real fear about this getting very out of hand. What do you think the meaning of this sort of latest 72 hours is? The meaning is very clear. Uh, the Saudis want to fight the Iranians to the last American. And right. America's foreign policy since Donald Trump was elected is about how much cash I can get. So he's selling America's foreign policy exactly like he's selling oil crude and he's selling apartments. It's the same thing. It's the same kind of transaction for him. Except if you are dealing with murderous thugs uh, like MBS and others, these people are... Mohammed bin Salman rule has been an unmitigated disaster. Think of this. Four years ago, he became a defense minister. His signature policy was the war in Yemen. He started bombing to oblivion, the poorest country in the Middle East. He started bankrolling when he understood he cannot win. Al-Qaeda, the extremist element of Al-Qaeda in Yemen, are fighting with Mohammed bin Salman. So our allies, US allies in Yemen, are actually hardcore jihadists. If this does not scare you, it should scare you even more than ever because Donald Trump 
while inviting the Taliban a week before 9-11, uh, he is actually using, selling the Saudis weapons that actually they are transferring to Al-Qaeda elements in Yemen to fight on their behalf. And now he wants America's air power to be basically the air power for Al-Qaeda who is operating on the ground in Yemen. Look at this picture. If that doesn't remind you of Afghanistan in the 80s, what does? There's, uh, people will say, and I think rightly, that U.S. has, the U.S. foreign policy has always sort of bent over backwards with the Saudis. Obviously, the key strategic interest is how much of the world's oil supply they control. That's a fact from the days when FDR first made his pact <coughs> sort of uh, House of Saud to, through the Bush administration to now. As someone who covers this region, what is different about this administration's treatment of the Saudis versus previous? But it's totally different. It's not anymore about America's interests. It's not about anymore about oil, because... Uh, America itself has sufficient oil and gas now that it can be independent from the Middle Eastern market. Uh, however, our relationship is about Donald Trump and Jared Kushner and how much money personally they are getting from MBS. MBS is very clear. He's, he's as transactional, as thuggish as it can be. He can butcher Jamal Khashoggi and then he get advice from Jared Kushner. He's telling, he's basically dictating America's foreign policy. It was the other way around. We were dictating to the Saudis what they needed to do before, whether it came, whether in the issue of uh, uh, the Palestinians, whether on the issue of radicals and others. I think President Obama was tough. And when they start, um, something happened in the Middle East where the idea of regime change, it started being exported to the other way around to the rest of the world. So they imported, they exported the regime change, the Saudi, to the American system. Hmm. So want to weigh in again right here, um, which once more what she's talking about is adding that much more tension to a tender box that is just ready to explode to begin with over there, and it's just causing insult to injury in destabilizing that particular territory rather than stabilizing that territory. Keep in mind the whole concept in behind in behind the Bush senior attacks during Desert Shield, Desert Storm, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, was to bring stability to a region that needed to be stabilized. Okay? What's going on now is adding insult to misery towards destabilizing making things even worse. It's uh, exacerbating the problem rather than helping the problem and now it looks like a, f a full out-and-out -out conflict is right at the brink of fixing to happen if it hadn't already pertaining to turning this into a bloodbath. Now what we are seeing is a sitting president in the White House who is beholden to a Saudi conference. It was the other way around. They were our client states. Right. Now the American, the United States of America is a client to the Middle East. We are doing what they want. We're in other words, what she's trying to say is that we have become their puppet. They have bought us off from the inside out and because of that Donald Trump will feel compelled to do whatever that the Saudi prince puts in action for us to do. That is a very, very I don't know if the right word would be unpopular position to be in or careless or even dangerous position to be in on the world market. Because you keep in mind we've got allies all over the world. Uh, let's just look at Turkey for a second. Turkey hates the Saudis. Turkey was the one that brought it to the national attention about the reporter that got butchered over there. Um, it's just, it's it's a recipe or a formula of catastrophe that is just at the brink of fixing to unveil its ugly head towards watching this thing 
get totally out of control is what she's talking about here. What, a dictator who murder journalists, activists who torture people, who basically send 15 goons to butcher and dismember a journalist, but also, you know, hang from ceilings women rights activists while pretending to be a reformist? We're beholden to that kind of guy. If this guy that is so unstable, there's rumors around the Middle East that he wants to have an open uh, war with Iran. Whatever it takes, I mean, that kind of open war will destabilize the world, not only the Middle East. It's worse. Iraq war will, be, will look like a walk in the park. Uh, Rula Jabril, who's been reporting on this and is reporting on it finally, thank you very much. Thank you. That's just about as serious as you can get towards what she's saying if it does, in fact, unravel the way that she's talking about. Because it would affect people's lives all over the world. Not just in certain parts of the world, but all over the world. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Coming up, the whistleblower within the intelligence committee whose complaint of misconduct could involve the president. So why is the director of national intelligence potentially breaking the law to keep it under wraps? What Congress is doing to get the answers in two minutes. House is not letting this person talk. Now, we know this whistleblower exists. Last month, he or she came forward inside the intelligence community, proper channels, filed a complaint. We know the whistleblower met the bar to get official whistleblower protections. The intelligence community inspector general determined the complaint, quote here, satisfied the statutory definition of an urgent concern, according to the House Intelligence Committee. Now, under the law, the Congressional House Intelligence Committee is then entitled to see what the whistleblower contain entails. Nevertheless, the acting director of national intelligence is withholding the complaint from Congress, saying you can't see it. According to the House Intelligence Committee, the acting DNI told the House Intelligence Committee the complaint, quote, involves confidentially and potentially privileged communications by persons outside the intelligence community. That phrase, privileged communications, set national security experts on fire this weekend because that only pertains to a very tiny circle of people, including the president and a few folks around him, which would seem to indicate that the misconduct is within that small group. Here's how Congressman Adam Schiff, the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, described it. No DNI, no director of national intelligence has ever refused to turn over a whistleblower complaint. And here, Margaret, um, the significance is the inspector general found this complaint to be urgent, found it to be credible. That is, they did some preliminary investigation, found the whistleblower to be credible. That suggests corroboration. Uh, and that involved serious or flagrant wrongdoing. Uh, and according to the director of national intelligence, the reason he's not acting to provide it, even though the statute mandates that he do so, is because he is being instructed not to. Now, this involved a higher authority, someone above the DNI. Well, there are only a few people yeah. above the DNI. In response, Congressman Schiff wrote to the acting director of national intelligence, quote, the committee can only conclude, based on this remarkable confluence of factors, that serious misconduct at issue involves the President of the United States and or other senior White House or administration officials. That letter came with a subpoena for that whistleblower complaint. Here with me now, Democratic Congressman Eric Swalwell, California, who serves on the House Intelligence Committee. Good to have you yeah, here. Thanks for having me back. Um, so th this is a little complicated, but first let's start with just the basic principle here that there is in the law legal statutory protections for whistleblowers inside the intelligence community. How does that work? Yeah. If you see something that is unlawful, you are protected if you say something, meaning you can't be fired. And also, uh, after about seven days, uh, Congress will be notified uh, and we're able to take uh, you know, our own uh, measures and if it's you know classified, it goes through you know a classification review uh, to make sure that you know it, it's nothing that is secret or top secret is disseminated, and that we can you know take action yet, you know and still protect our secrets. And my understanding of this, I mean, obviously, you know, post the Church, church Committee in the 1970s, there's an entire structure of intelligence oversight. That this is sort of part of that, right? I mean, the idea is that if you have a whistleblower, you need the, the Congress serves this really key role in overseeing the intelligence community because it's someone they can go to and, that isn't in their sort of direct chain of command. That's right. You have these abuses going on during the Nixon administration, and part of the cleanup, the reform, in addition to campaign finance, 
was the church commission. And they, one of the reforms they put in place was to protect people who would see something because before that, there wasn't an incentive to say something because you would probably lose your job or you know, politically be punished or even imprisoned. And so uh, here that protection is put in place. Now, uh, this is one, of course, unprecedented. Uh, two, we can deduce that it very likely involves the president or uh, senior people around him. Three is the chilling impact that would have on future whistleblowers. If, if, they, if people come forward uh, and see, if, if future whistleblowers may look at this and say, I don't know if I want to come forward, if it's not even going to make its way to the people who need to know. Is the conclusion that it's... I want to stop right there. You know, I didn't realize whenever I walked into a conspiracy pertaining to what went on out west in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, towards discovering the truth about there being a cover-up towards playing the position of being a whistleblower, I didn't have no earthly idea how serious that all these secrets that America has obtained in the past 25, 30, 35, 40 years, I didn't realize how serious that it is to step out into the eyes of the general public and expose the truth about a certain particular situation or exposing the identity to certain people that have played a part in a, in a cover-up. I didn't realize the the uh, consequences involved in doing this until I myself went through what I went through since 2000 and 2009 out in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. It's been basically now 10 years that has uh, dilapidated in my life but to this day, I'm still being haunted, taunted, aggravated, agitated, persecuted, dehumanized, demonized, because I stuck my nose into an affair that a lot of people think that I never should have gotten involved in, in regard to the noble lie, in regard to what in actuality happened out in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, pertaining to the 1995 Timothy McVeigh and Nichols homegrown uh, terrorist incident that happened here in America. But if you'll trace my work down before that, before I exposed the urgency of of disclosing the truth. My work actually goes down into the Mount Karma Waco incident that began with the Davidians of the Waco standoff, 51 day standoff, that once I found out the truth of what led into that particular incident which was a bunch of FBI agents that was setting a group of people up by entrapping them, by selling them weapons, uh, the fast and furious uh, weaponry that was coming out of the border down on the Texas-Mexico line there. Whenever I found out that, that what was actually going on was a group of people that was being entrapped, by the government, that shed a whole new different light on what actually happened in not only Waco pertaining to Mount Karma, but also in what happened out in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Because I touched off on some very, very sensitive information pertaining to bringing those two incidences together. It has caused me more grief, more sorrow, more pain, more aggravation, more embarrassment than one individual can ever, ever imagine 
that basically inundated my whole life. It inundated my my uh, professional uh, workplace. It inundated uh, even to this day, today, towards being able to go out to various churches without either being shunned, harassed, taunted, or just told, you're not welcome here, Juby. You just need to go on somewhere else because we're not going to accept you into our audience as either being a guest or a visitor, and which has happened again and again and again. I couldn't tell you how many times just within the past just within the past two two years since all this has really come to a head in my life and that's one reason why that I am so savvy in wanting to record uh, national as well as international events towards being able to also tell my side of the story uh, in regard to my defense because I know that my involvement out west was totally innocent as a whistleblower, as an investigator, as somebody that was wanting to get to the truth of the matters involving in total almost 300 people, lives that, that got uh, instantaneously taken out of this world. There has to be some sort of accountability whenever it comes to the credibility of various law enforcement agencies, regardless whether it's the FBI, the ATF, regardless whether it be local law enforcement agencies in Texas or local law enforcement agencies in Oklahoma or local law enforcement agencies in Kentucky. There has to be some sort of accountability in these administrations that are putting out fake, phony, false information to the general public. That's the reason why people such as myself was willing to put themselves out on a limb in becoming a whistleblower so that they could open up the eyes of the general public pertaining to the noble lie, the documentary called A Noble Lie, pertaining to the Oklahoma incident, and other media, media commentators who have put themselves out on the line towards basically discovering the truth about their phony baloney investigations and their phony baloney statements that they made to the general public. I think, personally, it is essential for the checks and balances. This is what makes a true uh, democratic government function properly, is the fact that you do have the checks and the balances. The checks and the balances. Because without the checks and the balances, we would basically become a communist-controlled country, the same as Russia, China, our, our Venezuela or, or, or uh, other parts of, of, the, uh, of the world to the point that then the people would become the substance of being nothing but robots to whatever the government officials told them to do. That's the reason why we have laws and constitutions and our own free minded people to be able to look and understand and, and decipher and, and take things and break it down and look at it and say, no, that ain't that, that couldn't have happened that way. But instead of me being rewarded for my work that I spent so much time and effort and energy on, to this day, I'm still being penalized. I'm still being looked down upon. I'm still being demonized and dehumanized because of my work of going beyond the call of duty in my civil duties to be able to find out the truth about these matters. And of course what drove me to that was because of what all went on over here in Weekly County 
of a bunch of people that was trying to smear my name and trying to uh, trying to uh, blackball me in the degree of falsifying files of trying to say, well, this individual is no good, and as far as we're concerned, he is a homegrown terrorist. In other words, they was trying to uh, uh, set me up and trap me and trying to destroy my character right here in my own home county. And because of it being so devastating in my life, I decided, well, you know, the only way that I'm going to be able to clear up towards exactly who I am and what I'm about is to go beyond the boundaries of this area here and just fluctuate out into the whole nation and that's exactly what I done. I started crossing various uh, community lines and various uh, state lines and I went beyond the region. But once more to this day as being a whistleblower in, that, in those regards it has costed this ministry, the Windmill Ministries ministry that I'm the founder of, it has costed this ministry dearly in discovering the truth in my work for the past few years. Please let's listen to this and then I'm going to have to let this go. Thank you for listening and uh, once more, our memento here at the Windmill Ministries Missions is good luck to all of us. Like the president of Small Circle from that letter from Odie and I, where they basically say, like, privileged communications, which is just not a big group of people. Uh, two parts. Uh, one, that it's outside the intelligence community. So it's not, a you know, someone of the CIA, NSA, FBI. Right. Uh, and then second is that, yes, the, the person who it also involves uh, has uh, or may have a privilege that they could assert. Now, mind you, this White House will go to great lengths to assert a privilege. For for example, tomorrow on the Judiciary Committee, we'll hear from Corey Lewandowski, and they're trying to assert privileges for someone who never worked at the White House. So, you know, this could be, uh, you know, someone in the president's family uh, who doesn't work at the White House. I mean, that's, you know, the lengths they'll go. Well, here's, here seems to be the problem. I mean, they have, now you're going to issue a subpoena. And I have seen this play out a ton of times. Congress tries to do its oversight role. The White House says, nope, you can't have it. And then you go to court, and then Lord knows where it ends up in court. I think empty chairs should mean empty pockets. And, you know, we should seek fines uh, because the president benefits from this. You know, what he does is he tells them not to cooperate, don't go in. They don't go in, and there's just this public confusion that's created because, you know, we're just relying on, you know, letters that we send back and forth, and we're trying to say, look, this is really bad. It's never happened before, but we can't tell you anything about it. That just, he wins because he overwhelms us. So, so then what's the question here? I mean, how urgent do we think this is? What Do you have any inkling of what this is about? Well, it's almost like it's a double whistleblower, right? You have the inspector general for the intelligence community coming forward to say, you guys should have heard about this. You didn't. If he was so moved to tell us that, to me, that said it's pretty important. Okay, so you got the whistleblower, and then the IG for the intelligence community is the one sort of flagging this. Like yeah. this person should be talking to Congress. Because we, we never would have heard about it unless he came forward. So about a. You so know, it's the IG who sort of alerts you to this issue. A couple of weeks go by when we should have known. Uh, it, we don't. He he figures out that we don't know. So he sends. Uh, you can see in Mr. Schiff's you know back and forth that right. there's a footnote uh, to the letter that the IG sent to Mr. to Mr. Schiff. So this is then like really waving a red flag in front of you, saying like something untoward, possibly law-breaking is going on here, right? I mean, they have a legal requirement to make this person available to you. Yeah, I, I see, you know, the the red light is flashing for Congress to know, and now it's, you know, how do we find out otherwise? Uh, you know, again, and, and is this whist whistleblower uh, in peril? I'm going to use an illustration real quick about what he's talking about. A few years ago, I don't know if people remember it or not, there was a bad tendency of your Ford Escorts rolling over and um, a lot of attention coming from the media uh, pertaining to these rollovers uh, was first engineered around the tires but then once they got to looking it was the chassis of the Ford Explorer I believe if I'm not if I'm not incorrect here that wasn't wide enough 
that was causing the instability in this vehicle to have more of a tendency of rolling over if it ever had a blowout on a tire. So whenever you're talking about a whistleblower, a whistleblower can be somebody that works for the media, that, that's, uh, that's paid attention to various uh, various things that's went on, that's created some sort of uh, a pattern, to somebody that's actually working in the White House of seeing things be unveiled in an incorrect, unprofessional, unethical way to the point that he or she is willing to stand up and say something about it, kind of like Eric Snowden. You know, Eric Snowden working for the CIA got to looking at the sensitivity of artificial intelligence and once he realized what he was looking at in the regard of improper privacy acts, that's whenever he blowed the whistle, whistle that basically costed him his freedom to this day. I guess he's still in Russia, the way that I understand, or in some foreign country. I don't know, it may not be Russia. But there is consequences in these whistleblowers that are coming forth blowing the whistle, and there's not supposed to be a consequence because these are the things that puts us back in checks and balances. These are the things that separates us from being a communist ruled dictated country. Do, how do you find out? I mean, what is the answer to that question? You know, so we're, we're demanding that uh, the DNI come in, uh, you know, and, and produce this information uh, by Thursday. So, uh, you know, he's got a couple days to do this, uh, and if he doesn't, you know, we're going to go through, and I'll leave it to Mr. Schiff, but we're going to go through, uh, you know, all the means that we have. Again, Chris, if we were in the minority, we would be so powerless. This just shows why it was so important to win the House. Um, when you say all the means you have, like a finding of contempt against the DNI, right. uh, some sort of court order for him to turn this over, I mean, those are the, re right. that's the remedy, I guess. That's the remedy. And we've done that with, you know, the Attorney General, we've done that with the Secretary of Commerce, and then it just gives you tools when you go to court. It doesn't happen as fast as you'd like, but again, we're not powerless. A year ago, we wouldn't have been able to do anything. All right. Uh, Eric Swalwell, who is on both Judiciary and the House Intelligence Committee. Great to have you here. Yeah, Thank you very much. Here. Thanks. Uh, next, workers across the country today, United States, the largest national strike in over a decade. Michael Moore is here to talk about the implications. Don't go away. The problem. Once more, we're talking about the sensitivity of the truth coming out to the general public based around 99.9% .9 of the time, greed and sometimes based around embarrassment. The situation that I walked off into in regard to the Mount Karma and the Oklahoma incident was based more around embarrassment than it was around greed because of certain particular law enforcement agencies policies that did not get handled in the proper form that basically uh, exacerbated the problem to the point of gross negligence. Thank you for listening. Good luck to all of us. Things is definitely uh, heating up over in the Middle East once more. My opinion about that is that it follows in suit with biblical Bible prophecy that no matter how determined we are towards not wanting to see Bible prophecy fulfill itself, the Bible says that it would have been easier for all of heaven and for all of earth to pass than for one jot or for one tittle of the word thy God to fail. And if it's written in stone for various things to, to occur over in that part of the world in the last days, I don't care how many people that you are got paid off, how many people that would be 
uh, opposing uh, the events that are unfolding if it is meant for it to occur in the era that we're in right now then it will in fact occur regardless of how much that we have tried to form a resistance of it not occurring it will in fact occur thank you good luck to all of us and shalom